Join us on Bookmark this month as we bring you some of our favorite early episodes from past seasons highlighting distinguished Catholic authors. This week, we're featuring my interview with Dr. Peter Kreeft on his book, Prayer for Beginners. This episode originally aired in May of 2005. And welcome to EWTN Bookmark, a special on location. We're here on the campus of Boston College at the Burns Library to speak with our author and guest, Dr. Peter Crave. Welcome, Dr. Crave. Thank you very much. EWTN's Bookmark. Uh, it took us coming here to get you on this program, but it's always been an intention of ours to get you on this program. You're a prolific author. How many books have you actually written? It's in the 40s, 45 or so. How many having to do with the Catholic faith? All of them in one way or another. Being a Catholic is not a specialty. Mm -hmm. Now, you were a convert, but it was quite a while ago, right? That was in college uh, from Dutch Reformed Calvinism at Calvin College. Read, well, my, read my way into the church. And read your way, reading the early church fathers? Reading or? the church fathers to try to prove to myself that Jesus founded a Protestant church, and you know the rest of the story. I found that he founded the church that I'm in. Okay, good. Now, when you wrote this particular book, which is Prayer for Beginners, published by Ignatius Press, what was the genesis of writing this book? The title says it. Uh, I'm a beginner myself. Most books on prayer are either vague and wimpy and say nothing, or they're so advanced that they're for people along the road pretty much advanced already. So I wrote this book for people like myself who are beginners mm -hmm. to teach them how to begin. It's the basics. It's you know, in reading this book, I know you say that in the very beginning about uh, that this book is uh, for Martha's and busy people and uh, uh, you need, also need a practical book written by somebody like you. But a lot of people would look and say, you know, Dr. Crave, I don't quite see myself at the level of your ability and your philosophical knowledge and knowledge of theology. How is it being the same? Is there some similarity when it comes This to is prayer? not a book on philosophy or theology. Most people can't write books on philosophy. I can. But most people aren't very good at prayer, and I'm not. So this is not false humility. I think I'm a pretty good philosopher and a pretty good writer, but I'm a lousy prayer. Okay. So I would like to have had the opportunity to read a book on prayer by somebody who had my difficulties. Mm -hmm. And I write the books that I wish somebody else would write, but they don't, so I have to. So you have to write them. Now you said that uh, you could have called this prayer for dummies. Yeah. Dummies not theoretically, dummies practically. Dummies who are so stupid that even though they know that when they pray they're happy, they don't pray. Mm -hmm. Now. You talk about also in this book of Brother Lawrence's little classic, The Practice of the Presence of God. What is that? That's one of the great little spiritual classics. Uh, well, what is that? It's a short and simple book, uh, and it sees the realization that God is really present as the key to opening up all sorts of things. Uh, he hasn't been canonized yet. It's not a classic on the level of the Doctors of the Church, but it's one of the most popular books ever written along with The Imitation of Christ or uh, Abandonment to Divine Providence. It's one of these very practical guides to sanctity. When did you first read it? In college. It cuts across lines. Uh, it's not a specifically Catholic book. It's not a Protestant book. It's so simple and so basic that uh, of all the spiritual classics, I would call it the absolutely simplest one I know. Mm -hmm. For someone else to read, a yes. person just starting out. He himself was not very bright. The, the monks assigned to him tasks like uh, uh, going to the market and buying wine, and he goofed them all up. Okay. He apparently had ADD and wasn't too bright, <laughs> like uh, a lot of academics. Was a diagnosed at the time, though, right. I'm sure, right? It's interesting, though, you, you talk about that, because so many times, in retrospect, the great saints were the doorkeepers, yeah. or these people, who, well, he doesn't know enough, we're gonna have, yeah. he can take care of the front door. I think it's very difficult for an intellectual to be a saint, because an intellectual has so many hiding places that he can create for his own mind. He can run and escape from himself. Is that something you see as an impediment for yourself? Of course, of course, I'm too smart for my own good. Okay. Most of us are. Now, in the, in the chapter of necessity, you say why praying is more important than eating, why is it? because eating is the life of the body and praying is the life of the soul, and the soul is more important than the body. Mm -hmm. You say you will get a new body after death in the resurrection at the end of the world, but you will not get a new soul. You will only purify and sanctify your old one. Yeah. So that's why it's important to hold on to that and to nourish it. That's what alive. you take, it, take with you. 
how do, you, how do you keep that from being too, uh, too much of a dualistic approach to as if there's some separation between the two? Well, the body is the soul's body. It's not a, a, a ship and you're the captain. It's not the horse and you're the rider. It's you. So when you die, you really die. The separation of the body and soul means that what is left, a soul, is not a whole person. It's an incomplete person. So you need a resurrected body. Death is unnatural. It splits soul from body. If dualism were true, if we were a soul that were imprisoned in a body, then death would not be unnatural. It would revert us to our natural state. That's the Gnostic view. Okay. Now you mentioned that this book can change your life if and only you do two things with it. What are those two things? Believe it and do it. Mm -hmm. It's not understand it. That's easy. It's a duh book. But uh, you have to do it. The very first and most important thing about prayer is just do it. Methods are, are secondary. Mm -hmm. Now, you ha this book is, is fairly small, but you mentioned you re have to read it slowly and drink it in. Because you think too many times people are looking for quickie self-help books and they want to uh, kind of learn the method and they learn about prayer but not how to pray. Our society loves self-help books because we're very good at technology. So we want to apply technology to things like prayer. We can't. Technology is a way of pushing buttons, doing hard things by an easy means, but prayer is not a button. Prayer is like love. It's, it's, it's whole, it's integral. You can't separate the means from the end, the button from the machine. So just do it. Mm -hmm. Well, you talk about this being a cookbook and not a dinner. Reading a cookbook is not very interesting. Uh, applying the cookbook practically uh, is interesting because the dinner tastes good. So reading this book and not doing it is not that interesting, but doing it, well, mm -hmm. that is interesting. You can end up with a fine meal that way. Yeah. Okay. You say, do not be like the theologian who after death was given the choice between going to heaven or going to a lecture on heaven and chose the lecture. What does that mean? That means we love to think about things more than to do them. In fact, those of us who live too much in our own minds, I think, sometimes believe that we've done something just because we've imagined doing it. Praying, becoming a saint, just because we love it, just because we admire it, we think we've got it. No, we have to do it. Mm -hmm. And we can, uh, too much head knowledge and not enough yeah. living it out and putting it into action. Yeah, imagine a driver who's so in love with the road map that he doesn't travel much. He just pulls along the side of the road and look, looks at the map. <laughs> looks at the map. The Pharisees were like that. Jesus said to them, you search the scriptures because you think that you have in them eternal life. And here I'm standing in front of you and I'm offering you life and you're not coming to me. Imagine Romeo uh, looking at Juliet's picture and mooning over it. And Juliet knocks on his door and he says, go away, I'm too busy. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, you also talk about impatience being one of our biggest uh, problems. Why impatience? We want a McDonald's fast food spirituality. We want button pushing spirituality. We want to see results. We don't want to grow gradually. We want to run faster than God's grace. We want to run faster than, than the kind of spiritual genetic programming that's inherent in our souls, which have to grow along with our bodies. Now, in the section that you have in this, you talk about motives, 10 compelling reasons to pray. You say that only prayer can save the world. How so? Only prayer can make saints, and only saints can save the world. There's a Jewish legend about the 12 righteous men who keep the world alive. I think it's based on the Abraham story when he intercedes for Sodom and Gomorrah, and he gets God down to 10. If he could find 10 righteous men, Sodom and Gomorrah would be saved. He, qu he can't. Uh, if the number of saints go down to nine, uh, God ends the world. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe that's not literally true, but something like it certainly is. Imagine a world without saints. That's a world that's gonna get sicker and sicker. Mm -hmm. Saints are like doctors. The thing you write in here too, that I thought was interesting, it says, we must pray because God commands it. And that's a thing it seems a lot of people rebel about going to mass or anything else is if because it's, I should get something out of it. I should pray because when I do, I feel good. That's a very deep mistake. That's playing God. That's saying, I get to make the rules here and I choose prayer, I choose mass, I choose God. No, he chooses you. The fundamental reason for praying, the fundamental reason for, for being 
a Catholic, the fundamental reason for sending out missionaries, the fundamental reason for enduring persecution has to be God commands it. It's a response that's built into our being. God's the creator, we're the creature. He begins, we respond. He initiates, we say yes or no. We're used to autonomy. We're used to initiating things in relation to each other. We want to be movers and shakers. We can't be that in relation to God. That doesn't mean we have to be passive. When God initiates, we have to actively respond by saying yes. It's the Marian thing. She says, yes, be it done to me according to your word. That's Fiat. not passivity. Okay. That's activity. Mm -hmm. Now you say, and this would be the next question, if God commands us to pray, why does he command us to pray? Not that he needs it, but he sees that we need it. Uh, he doesn't need anything. So all these commands are for our benefit, not for his. And we pray not to change his mind, but to change our mind. And that opens us up and so important, the listening aspect of prayer, yep. to hearing what God is speaking to us about. Even when we talk, we have to listen because we're talking to God in obedience to him and in conformity to him. So it's a, a conforming talking. So the action is, is one of obedience as well as the listening. Mm -hmm. I mentioned before that you, you, use the, you talk about Martha and the whole idea of praying. And in this section, you also talk about how so many people say, I just don't have time to pray. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? We who have all these technological time-saving inventions have much less time than our ancestors. I think that's true in every age. We try to keep busy because, partly because we're afraid to face ourselves and our own inner emptiness. So we're all Marthas running around like octopuses trying to do eight things at once. And Jesus shocks us and says, Mary's chosen the better part. She does only one thing at a time. She sits at my feet. If we don't first sit at his feet, then all our octopusing is gonna be just our octopusing. But if we start with the Mary thing, then we do the Martha thing, and it's different. Then we do the works of Martha in the spirit of Mary. Is that why it's so important sometimes, even in religious orders, uh, that it seems like they get out of balance where they almost put the social work in front of the faith aspect? Oh yeah, it's easy to do that because you can feel good about the social work. You can say, oh look, I've succeeded there. You can never feel good about your success in prayer because you have an infinite road to, to go. So you can never say, ah, now I have made it. I am a successful prayer. That's like saying, I am a successful lover. Always more to learn. The goal is infinite, yes. Okay. And the more you do it, the more you see that there's more to learn. Yes, okay. yes. yes. If, if, if you think there's not more to learn, that means there is more to learn. In other words, in prayer, as in philosophy, there's only two kinds of people, fools who think they're wise and the wise who know that they're fools. Lesson one is, we're a fool. It's better than the latter to learn. Yes. Okay. Now, you make the statement, divine love made purgatory. Divine love did not make hell. Sin made hell. What do you mean divine love made purgatory? Purgatory is, is purging, cleansing, perfecting. Why do we have to go through purgatory? Because God loves us so much that he wants us perfect. And at the end, we'll thank him for it. So all the pains of purgatory are for our ultimate happiness and our perfection and our joy. So purgatory is full of hope. Uh, St. Catherine of Genoa says there's more joy in purgatory than there is on earth okay. because you're so close to heaven. You're in heaven's bathroom, so to speak, washing up for dinner, okay. but there's no joy in hell, no hope either. Now you put in, and I think it's two different times in the book, I think I remember this statement that you quoted, uh, Lewis quoting George MacDonald, like a good earthly father, he is, meaning God, is easy to please but hard to satisfy. Easy to please, very merciful. Uh, he'll rejoice at our first clumsy steps at prayer, as a father will rejoice at his little infant toddler's attempts to walk, but he's not going to be satisfied until we're prima, prima ballerina. Jesus puts our job description in these words, you must be perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. That's how far we have to go. And yet he totally loves and totally accepts the little children who come stumbling to him, not just physically, but his own apostles are spiritual children who stumble all the time. Look at Peter. He's always putting his foot in his mouth. Right. Is that also a kind of a, a problem we run into today where people say, well, God loves me just the way I am? <sighs> that's half true and half false. Of course God loves you just the way you are because that's the way you are. 
the real you is the concrete you that God loves, not just some imagined abstract ideal in the future, but he's not satisfied with you the way you are. And any lover is like that. They, they accept not just the present moment, but the whole future life of the beloved. In the Song of Songs, the bridegroom who symbolizes God says to the bride who symbolizes us, or the human soul, behold, you are all fair, my love. There is not a spot or a wrinkle in you. He can say that because he's in eternity and he sees our future, which is to be perfect. And that's the same us that right now is stumbling and imperfect, but we're not in eternity. So we can't do that kind of acceptance as we are, as if we're already perfect. That's unrealistic, that's playing God. Okay. Uh, you also write, if we are in Christ, we are moving with the most pressing speed for we are in the most dynamic man who ever walked the earth. When he says to us, follow me from Matthew 8, he is not saying, please remember to be nice. No. He wasn't nice. You don't take nice people and nail them to crosses. And follow me doesn't mean just follow my example, my words. It means follow me. He's still present among us. He's still moving. He sent his spirit, which is a mighty wind. So getting into that wind is like surfing on an enormous wave. It's exciting. It's like a police chase. Here he is riding down the street at 100 miles an hour, and he says, catch me. Now, you make a point in here that, uh, you know, we talk about our Heavenly Father, but not, not in the case of saying our uncle who art in heaven. What's the distinction between a father and an uncle to you? Most kids would love to take vacations with their uncle because their uncle uh, just gives them fun and doesn't make demands on them. Uh, God is never called an uncle. He's always called a father. He's not called a grandfather either. Abraham Heschel, the great rabbi, uh, says, God is not an uncle, God is an earthquake. Mm -hmm. Now, in the section you talk about the words, you talk about prayer, one of the things, uh, you talk about vocal prayers as conversations with God, and the idea that sometimes people think that vocal prayers are, uh, you know, you shouldn't be doing this, uh, that it's a simple way of praying, or it's a rote way of praying. But you point out how important that is as a beginning prayer, right? Yeah. We're... <sighs> We're subject to so many distractions. We're so scatterbrained and absent-minded that it is extremely difficult to keep our mind on God. Words do that. Words focus our mind. They, they educate us. They're like, uh, uh, they're like strollers for infants or, or curbs for travelers. They keep you on the right road. It's true, contemplative prayer is higher than verbal prayer, but contemplative prayer can't come at the beginning. It comes out of verbal prayer. The verbal prayer leads you to contemplative prayer. And I, I, I don't even think that the two are, are that sharply distinguished because there can be a lot of contemplation in verbal prayer. You can even pray while you, while you sing or while you listen to music. It doesn't have to be totally silent. Right, and even in saying the rosary, there can be a lot of contemplation going on, obviously, as part of that. Yeah, it works in a, a psychological way similar to a mantra in Hinduism. The mantra keeps the busy, fussy part of you quiet so that it frees the deeper contemplative part. Now you say our conversation with God should be utterly free and familiar because God is the only person who will never ever misunderstand us and never ever reject us. Yeah, we're afraid of those two things from each other. You don't really understand me. You don't really love me with the whole of your being. So I'm gonna hold back and I'm gonna fake it and I'm gonna use these masks so that we can have a, an acceptable and safe social relationship. And at the same time, we long for that total intimacy and total knowledge and total self-giving, which we can never have with another human being, but we can have it with God. So there's no need to fake anything with God. It's the most stupid thing in the world to try to fake out God. Right. He's light. Right. He already knows, doesn't he? Yeah. I mean, 20 million Americans supposedly have had out-of-body experiences and met the being of light, and every single one of them says that the being of light looked at them and knew everything and nevertheless accepted them and loved them. And they were blown away by the fact that he could know everything and yet love them. Okay, that acceptance. You also say there is absolutely no contradiction between saying we come to God freely and familiarly and saying we do not come casually. What's that dis distinction? Freely and familiarly is 
the confidence in God's knowledge and love. Casually means almost the opposite of freely and familiarly. Casually means, oh, you're just a casual friend. You're an interviewer here. Uh, I'm just a guest on the show. You're just uh, the bus driver. Uh, so you can joke, but the jokes that you tell with the bus driver are different than the jokes that you tell with your father. They're less intimate. Okay. So even, even the humor that you have with God is a deeper humor. It's not casual. It's deep. It's, it's, it's like the humor you share with, with, with a spouse. You have can you... be more intimate with your spouse than with anybody else in the world, and yet at the same time, the awe and the respect that you have for your spouse is greater than for anybody else in the world. And because of that intimacy, the humor is, is at a different level because so many things can go unsaid and unspoken, and yep. you still get the joke. Yeah, yeah. The joke is who you are. It's not a clever set of words. Now, you talk about in Chapter 5, Stop, Look, and Listen. Uh, that was an old song by the Hollies, I think, but you were talking about prayer in here. Stop, Look, and Listen. Is that uh, the idea that uh, the first thing we have to do is stop doing so that we can what? So that we can turn our attention on God and practice His presence and look at what is. And the massive fact that God is present is the most important thing. And then when we realize that this is a God who speaks to us, who cares about us, who's not just there, but in dialogue with us, knocking on our door, then the final step is to listen. But before you can listen, you have to see or look. And before you can look, you have to stop. I think the hardest step is the first one, to stop. Was We're flywheels. We keep going round and round. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think most of us, at least in America, are so busy and so used to succeeding in some sort of business, some sort of busyness, that we feel good about that. Uh, and we're not very good at stopping. We're not very good at, at silence and contemplation. So there's a greater reluctance, I think, in our society today to stop and be silent and to look than there is in past societies because we're so good at the other thing and so bad at this thing. And are we also looking so many times we want immediate quick results. We want to see the outcome of this right away. The, the benefit is immediate. I think it's got a lot to do with time. The reason we want quick results is we feel that we have so little time. Our days are so full that uh, if we waste time here, something else is going to have to suffer. Well, let it suffer. But, but as you point out, I think in this book elsewhere, when it we do only have limited time, right? Because we are all going to die. That's right. That's right. And our society does not focuses on death. Death is something that's still covered up despite all the books on it. People don't die, they pass away. And we hope for an almost indefinitely extended lifespan. We demand uh, the world's greatest health care system. Paradoxically, only when you're quite aware that you're going to die do you have the time and the silence to pray. That is paradoxical, isn't it? When you realize you have only a finite amount of time, then you'll give that time to prayer. But when you forget that and you imagine that you can go on forever and ever, then you're terribly worried about time and busyness and you don't have any time to pray. Right, and as you point out, no one ever, no theologian died and ever said, gee, I should have been watching more television or doing something else with my life. That gives you a great writing. sense of perspective. Samuel Johnson's uh, wonderful words, I know of no thought that more wonderfully clarifies a man's mind than the thought that tomorrow he will hang. <laughs> Good point. In, in the section on faith, you say that's the one prerequisite for prayer, faith. And it says faith is very simple. Faith says God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Sometimes people think of that as being, they think of that as being a fundamentalist kind of bumper sticker on cards. The Bible said it. Is there a difference between the Bible saying it and God saying it in that way? Well, if you define a fundamentalist as somebody who takes everything in the Bible literally, that's an unsophisticated literary theory, but I don't think it's at all unsophisticated theologically. If God said it, that does settle it. It should settle it for you, if you believe it. Right. Now, if you don't believe it, then you've got a problem. And everything comes from that problem. Your problem's in prayer, your problem's in life. Do I trust him or don't I? Is this true or isn't it? That's the fashionable mindset of our society. And anybody who says it's true because God says so is dismissed as an arrogant uh, fundamentalist. 
Well, and there's I guess, nothing worse to be in the society virtually today. Oh, that's than the a F word. That's right. the F word. Right. You can be at a fashionable cocktail party and confess that you're a, a, oh, a, a terrorist who is a, a bomb thrower or plotting a worldwide revolution. But if you confess that you believe that God said it, and I believe it, and that settles it, uh, the temperature will suddenly chill. Just before we go, how long did it actually take you to put this book together? Not long at all, a couple of weeks. It's a very simple book. And when do you usually do your writing? No particular time. I have no schedule. Whenever I have time, I uh, uh, stand online in department stores and write books. Uh, I'll uh, uh, sit in the bathroom and write books. I'll get up late at night and write books anytime. Well, we are happy that you found the time to write this book and encourage others to find the time to pray. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Crave, talking about the book. Prayer for Beginners, published by Ignatius Press. I'm Doug Keck. It's available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Thank you for joining us right here on EWTN Bookmark. Catch us next time.